Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lazy Programmer Show. In this video, we are going to talk about another very common question I get, which is how do I build my own computer science degree? Now, before we get to answering this question, I want to discuss why anyone would want to ask this question in the first place. If you want to learn machine learning, why do you need to learn anything else? Why not just jump right into machine learning? Okay, but we have to ask ourselves, where do students learn machine learning typically? Yes, nowadays you can learn machine learning online, as you do with my courses. But as you know, these courses come with prerequisites. So you can't just take a random person off the street and teach them machine learning. But what is the typical path students take to learn machine learning? Well, the answer to that is, students will usually apply for college under either the statistics department or the computer science department. These days, it's still the case that statistics hasn't fully embraced machine learning, and there are a lot of skills that are required in machine learning that are not taught to statistics students. So in this lecture, we will focus on computer science rather than statistics. Okay, so if you take courses in machine learning and artificial intelligence, usually these will be during the final years of your degree. Why is that? Well, it's because these courses depend on all the things you learned in the first two years, generally speaking. Some examples of the courses you might take in the first two years are calculus, linear algebra, probability, programming, data structures, and so on. So this lecture is all about how to find such courses yourself at the college level, such that you can learn the equivalent of a computer science degree program. For all the people who ask me, how do I prepare myself for machine learning, this is the answer. Before we continue on with this lecture, just a short reminder that we are already three weeks into the month-long VIP sale of my latest course on PyTorch. After releasing the leading TensorFlow 2 course on Udemy, I thought it would be an excellent idea to teach PyTorch 2, the next up-and-coming major deep learning library. In fact, many indicators suggest that this era is already here. Companies like OpenAI and Apple have switched to PyTorch, and Facebook, who is now the primary developer of PyTorch, obviously uses it as well to serve their billions of users. Today, most research papers are implemented in PyTorch, so I think the evidence is clear where the field of deep learning is going. Use the link in the description below to get your copy of the VIP version of PyTorch today. Remember that the VIP version contains entire sections of material that will not be available in the non-VIP version of the course. This course contains everything, from the basics like ANNs, CNNs, and RNNs, all the way up to transfer learning, recommender systems, GANs, NLP, facial recognition, and building a stock trading bot using deep Q learning. Again, these coupons expire in less than two weeks, so get your copy today. Now at this point, a lot of people might say, yeah, well, I can just watch YouTube or Khan Academy. These videos are way more intuitive than your average college course. Why should I waste my time on some college course? So this is your first lesson in this video. If you are trying to teach yourself something, do not put the responsibility on your instructor to give you the knowledge. If you think you're just going to watch some videos and automatically understand calculus, you are in for a huge surprise. So here's where a lot of people are going to get stuck. What's the difference between watching YouTube or Khan Academy versus taking a college course? In terms of the lectures, perhaps not much. It's possible that the lectures on YouTube and Khan Academy may be more intuitive for you since they are designed that way on purpose. It's probably the case that the material from the college course will be more complex than what you will find on YouTube or Khan Academy. So if you skip those college lectures, you may be missing out on some very crucial skills. It's most certainly the case that those lectures on YouTube or Khan Academy will be more entertaining. Generally speaking, people enjoy YouTube and Khan Academy much more than they enjoy college lectures, if they even enjoy them at all. But remember, you are not here for entertainment. At most, YouTube and Khan Academy will be good supplements to what you are learning. But if what you are looking for is entertainment, you've already lost. You can go home. If you came to be entertained, you are really going to struggle. Why do I say this? Okay, so in a college course, there are homework assignments. There are exams and tests. In a college course, you are essentially forced to do these things. This is the exact opposite of entertainment. Obviously, it's still ultimately your choice 
but you will face severe consequences in terms of the money you spent and your career path. If you have to take the same course twice, that's a waste of money, and you are much less likely to get hired if you got all C's and D's. So for all intents and purposes, you are being forced to do the work. Now consider what happens in the self-learning scenario. Nobody is going to assign you any homework. Nobody is going to force you to sit down and write an exam. And yet, this is the crucial ingredient to your learning. It's not about the material you can absorb while you watch YouTube. It's about the problems you can solve and can demonstrate the ability to solve. We can think about this using a simple diagram. In one case, the student is looking for the information to come in. The information is going towards the student. In the other case, the student is producing the information. The student is applying what they learned to produce useful output. Obviously, you want to be the second student, not the first. Many people think, I am confident in my ability to solve these problems. I know what I'm doing. And yet, these people have never solved any problems. They only think they can. So that's your lesson. Don't be someone who simply believes they can solve problems. Guess what happens when you eventually take my courses? Instead of you finding the problems, the problems will find you. And you're going to quickly discover that you can't actually do them when you thought that you could. So make sure that you can actually solve the problems. Once you realize this, it's easy. Most college level textbooks come with problems in the book. So if you can work on those problems and you are successful, then you can consider yourself competent in that subject. Now that being said, what are my recommendations? In fact, my recommendations are not courses at all. My recommendations are books because these books contain the problems that you can solve so that you can evaluate yourself. Since you have no instructor to evaluate you, you have to depend on yourself and you have to be honest with yourself. In fact, by going through this process, you will be even more competent than your typical college student. The reason for that is, the incentives for the student are somewhat misaligned with the actual purpose of the school. The purpose of going to school is to learn, but the incentive for the student is to get good grades. Often, students will sacrifice true understanding or deep thinking in order to find workarounds to get things done. Students are often strapped for time, yet as a self-learner, you will have no time limits and nobody will know your grade except you because you'll be giving it to yourself. So as a self-taught learner, you have the opportunity to take a more honest and in-depth approach. So there are pros and cons to both sides of the coin. If you actually attend college as a student, then things will move very fast and your incentives will not be aligned with true learning. However, you will be forced to do all the work, which some people really need to get anything done. Sometimes people just don't want to do anything. They need other people to tell them what to do. In fact, I would estimate that this applies to a majority of people in the world. On the other hand, if you are a self-taught learner, then you have lots of time to truly understand everything in detail. Your incentives are perfectly aligned with true learning. However, since nobody is forcing you to do any work, you may have lots of trouble motivating yourself to get started and to do something that doesn't include just watching YouTube. Again, some people just need to be told what to do before they do anything, and that's just fine. It's better to recognize that you are that kind of person and to set yourself up to learn in a way that's efficient for you. Okay, so let's get down to the details. What books do I recommend? Firstly, I want to mention that you can find all these books on my website under the URL lazyprogrammer.me slash csdegree. So you don't have to type anything out here manually, and you don't have to Google these on your own. Just go to my site, and there will be links to all these books there. These books will focus on five core courses, which are Calculus, Linear Algebra, Probability, Programming, and Algorithms. Note that I've chosen these books for several important reasons. First, many of these are books which are used by actual college programs. So if you want to make sure you're at the right level, this is the way. Second, these books come with excellent exercises to work through. You don't have to do all of them, but you should at least have some idea of how to solve the problems that you didn't go through fully. Okay, so for calculus, I recommend the book Early Transcendentals by James Stewart. Now, you might look at this book and think, oh gosh, this book is 1,000 pages long. I'm never going to finish this. 
Luckily, you don't have to go through the whole book. Obviously, you should eventually, but if you want to fast track into machine learning, then you can focus on certain parts. So here's an easy rule of thumb you can use as a guideline. Calculus can be split into three parts, roughly. The first part is differentiation. The second part is integration. The third part is multivariable calculus, which does both differentiation and integration with multiple variables. Okay, so for most of machine learning, you will mostly need differentiation. So if you focus on differentiation in one and multiple dimensions, this should prepare you for topics such as linear regression, logistic regression, and deep learning. So that would be all of part one and part of part three. On the other hand, if you want to get into Bayesian statistics or Bayesian machine learning, you will need to be comfortable with integration. Now it's important to recognize that in college, calculus isn't just one single course. In fact, calculus is usually three courses, simply called Calculus 1, Calculus 2, and Calculus 3. So don't be afraid if you realize you're not going to finish this in a week, or even a month, or even six months. Okay, so for linear algebra, I recommend the book Introduction to Linear Algebra by Gilbert Strong, who is a famous linear algebra instructor from MIT. For this book, unlike calculus, you will want to go through every chapter. Luckily, this book isn't 1,000 pages long, it's about half that. However, if that's still too much for you, then you will at least want to do the first half of the book, which goes up to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The next chapter is on principal components analysis and singular value decomposition, which I actually cover in my courses, so there's some crossover between this book and actual machine learning. Okay, so for probability, I recommend the book titled Introduction to Probability, written by two authors whose names I can't pronounce. This is another book where I would pretty much recommend going through every chapter. It's another book that's about 500 pages long. If you're strapped for time, then I recommend at least the first five chapters, which goes up to the central limit theorem. Note that the later chapters again cross over with machine learning and statistics. So for example, chapter seven is about Markov chains. This goes more in depth than what you would need for my courses, but it should be interesting nonetheless. Chapter 8 goes into Bayesian methods. Not necessary, but extremely useful if you're going to take any of my courses on Bayesian machine learning. Chapter 9 goes into statistical inference, for example, maximum likelihood estimation, confidence intervals, significance testing, and even linear regression. From my own observations, I found that students have a lot of trouble with maximum likelihood, so this chapter is strongly recommended, especially since linear regression crosses over with my courses in machine learning. Okay, so for programming, this may surprise you, but I do not recommend Python. Python is a language that's pretty easy to learn, so it's likely that you will pick it up yourself regardless. Instead, I actually recommend learning Java. The reason I recommend Java over Python is because the next topic I'm going to recommend learning about is algorithms and data structures. In order for that topic to make any sense, you'll want to be familiar with the low-level operations that are common in Java, but not so much in Python. Python is so high-level that it often hides these details from you. So when you go on to study algorithms, you'll have no idea why they're needed or why you should care. Okay, so for programming, I recommend the book Big Java by Horseman. Luckily, although this book is very long, you can skip many of the chapters. Basically, you want to learn about classes, objects, data types, arrays, strings, recursion, and basic data structures. My recommendation would be everything up to chapter 17 on trees, which brings you to just over half the book. Okay, so the final core topic you should learn about is algorithms and data structures. This one is advanced, but at the same time, I think it provides lots of useful skill in thinking about the algorithmic efficiency of your code. This will prevent you from making silly mistakes that make your code unnecessarily slow. And also it just improves your programming skills. Okay, so for algorithms and data structures, I recommend the classic book, Introduction to Algorithms. Since the author's names start with CLRNS, people often just refer to this book as CLRS. All right, so this is another very long book. Most of this book you will probably not read. It is a very dense book, so expect to spend a long time per chapter. Note that if you're really strapped for time, 
then I would say, don't even read this book at all. But if you really want to hone your skills, then I would strongly consider it. By the way, whenever you hear about software companies asking their interviewees whiteboard coding problems, they are usually referring to the kinds of problems you would find in this book. So if you ever want to become a software engineer or get into a role where people are serious about coding, then this is exactly the book you want to read. Okay, so if you do decide to read this book, then you'll want to start with chapters 1 to 3. This will introduce you to some of the basic ideas that you'll be using in the rest of the book, such as time complexity and big O notation. Next, I would recommend learning about sorting, specifically heap sort and quick sort. At the very least, quick sort. For data structures, I would recommend the chapters on elementary data structures, hash tables, and binary search trees. For the section on advanced design and analysis techniques, I would recommend the chapters on dynamic programming and greedy algorithms. By the way, dynamic programming appears in a few places in machine learning, such as hidden Markov models. We've seen greedy algorithms as well in the context of Epsilon Greedy. Finally, I would recommend learning about graphs. In this section, basically my advice is to get through as much as you can. Software interviewers love questions about graphs. Finally, there are some optional topics you may want to learn about, in addition to the previous core topics. These will give you more context into why we do what we do in machine learning, and also just more practice with coding, which is always useful. Remember that the whole goal of this lecture is for you to do exercises, and learning these other topics will give you plenty of opportunity to do such exercises. Note that at this time, I won't recommend any books for these electives in order to keep things short, but if I do add books on these topics in the future, you will find them at lazyprogrammer.me slash csdegree. Okay, so the first elective I would recommend is databases. Learn how to use Postgres and MySQL. So databases are extremely useful to know about because obviously that's where people store their data. If you're going to work as a data scientist, a data engineer, or even just a regular programmer, you have to know how to work with databases. On that topic, I also recommend web development. Personally, I think the experience of building a fully functional web application is very enlightening. It will give you insight into every aspect of a web product. As mentioned previously, you'll need a database to store your data. You'll also need to use a backend programming language for your server. This could be something like Python, Java, or Ruby. You'll also need to work on the front end. That's what the user sees. So you'll need to learn about HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. The point of this isn't to become a web designer and build very nice, fancy websites, but rather, your goal is to understand how users interact with your website and create data that you can analyze and act on. So when we talk about data in data science, it's not some mythical abstract thing. You'll need data if you want to recommend the best products and links to your users. You'll need data if you want to block spammers from accessing your site. You'll need data to decide what the best color scheme for your website is. All of these things can be framed as statistical and machine learning problems. Now, another question you might have is, once I've completed all this stuff, what comes next? Well, what comes next is the fun part. That's where you get to do actual machine learning. Of course, machine learning itself is a broad topic. Today, I have over 25 courses on various areas of machine learning, and I don't see myself running out of topics anytime soon. Luckily, I've already made a video on which order to take those courses in, which you can find on my website, deeplearningcourses.com slash course order. So basically, the beginning of that list would be where you should start from at the end of your studies in calculus, linear algebra, and so on from this video. Of course, you can always try your hand at skipping ahead, but obviously you have to be competent enough to know where you have to fill in the gaps. All right, so I hope those recommendations are useful for you. Remember that any skill worth learning will take some effort. Remember that it's not about how many videos you watch or how many courses you sign up for. This lecture is all about flipping a switch in your mind. It's about making you realize that doing the work is not someone else's responsibility. It's your responsibility. If you don't do the work, then you won't gain the skills. 
If you like this video, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.